in Kenya, when financial sector deepening uh, did a report on where Kenyans, Kenyans borrow, they found out that Kenyans mainly borrow for consumption, so they get money from their kiosk, or they mainly borrow for emergencies, so they use mobile loans. I am going to focus on what alternative, flexible, and patient capital that you can use for your particular business. When we look at the type of capital that is available, it's basically split into three categories. We're looking at debt, we're looking at equity, and we're looking at mezzanine financing. I am going to take you through a series of investor categories that operate alongside these categories. Um, now, when most entrepreneurs, just as we saw from the poll, they self-finance their business. They usually do this by bootstrapping, so they're using their own savings, or they use retained earnings, as you've shown us. So whilst that is great and gets you to demonstrate skin in the game, it can only take you so far. When you're looking to grow your business and to scale your business, then external financing is preferred. And these are a number of ways that you can basically approach this financing. Now, according to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, six out of 10 entrepreneurs use friends, a family, and relatives. Those are the people that actually invest in your business for the first time. It's easy, they know you, they're familiar with you, and they're able to provide your business uh, with capital. You find that um, as much as you use it, and the, and the relationship is usually quite informal. So even though that this uh, mode of financing can take you to a particular level, you'll find that the relationship between having friends and family who think they own a stake in your business or want to have a say in your activities might lead you to seek an alternative other, other alternative funders. And this is where angels come in. Angels are essentially high net worth individuals. They could be successful entrepreneurs or they could be successful uh, professionals. They look at this as a form of giving back some of their uh, social respons uh, responsible um, task of giving back some of their uh, knowledge and learning of being in business. They can provide mentorship and support and they can basically stick it out for the longer haul. And I think we've seen a examples of angels through the show Lion's Den locally. And I think the one thing I would point out is to get the attention of an angel, you really have to be exceptional. Now, um, because the relationship with an angel is quite um, personal and it's a really referral network, you might find that you're better off with crowdfunding where this is a platform of angels. So these are people that might not necessarily have as much money as the individual angel, but because they are able to pool their resources together, it actually becomes a considerable lump sum. And there as an entrepreneur, you're able to use this platform in order to get global uh, visibility uh, because angels can be across the world uh, regionally. You're able to get instant feedback on your product and they rarely take equity stakes. If we look at it from a Kenya perspective, we actually have Mchanga, where we actually pool money together. We tend to use it more for sympathy purposes. There is an opportunity to use Mchanga more for business purposes. There is also an opportunity to look at Chamas and to look at circles in the digital age and to see how more can they be like crowdfunding platforms. We then have more structured programs, and these are business accelerators. It's something that we, even as the trust, offer, where you have a specific cohort of individuals. They come through um, a period. It's usually a competitive process. It's anything between three to nine months. And here, people are provided tailored mentorship. They're provided net networking opportunities, both sex successful entrepreneurs, successful uh, inve investors. They're 
are basically given tailored coaching and support, and it usually culminates into a demo or pitch day. Business accelerators have been loaded, especially ones that are quite connected, really with providing tangible contacts with investors. When investors are sourcing deals, they can go to an accelerator that's known to have a strong pipeline. And then there's grant investment, which we tend uh, to take for granted. Grant investment are really the early adopters. These are institutions that either support entrepreneurship or want to spur investment in a new area, possibly due to a market failure or because that area is perceived so uh, risky. Again, to get a grant, even though it's non-repayable, grants are actually um, uh, grants um, are actually quite competitive and have a, a, a competitive process when you want to join and get a grant. Very good for businesses in the early stages that are looking at building their working capital product development. Then we go on to venture capital. Now, venture capital is probably the most famous known of capital because it is responsible for producing the tech giants of today. A venture capital really looks for high growth and scale, looking for ownership amounts of about 30% equity stakes, really looking for disruption businesses, unicorns, as they call them. Now, as much as we hear about venture capital, because some of the companies that we know today were financed with them, it's very difficult to actually access venture capital um, support. But if you actually have a very unique solution, then why not try venture capital? We have mezzanine finance, which is a hybrid of, of, of debt and equity. And really what uh, mezzanine finance is doing with small and medium enterprises is really to have more flexible forms. So it has longer periods. It's more patient in terms of the debt. It has debt that can convert to equity. It has different flexible financing structures, such as revenue-based financing, and uh, really good for uh, um, different enterprises that are looking for different ways of, of, of paying back rather than regular cash flows. Then we have private debt uh, and private equity. And this is where um, a lot of institutional investors uh, will, will come together um, and, and they will come together really in the form of limited partnerships. And what they'll do as the form of limited partners will really invest in companies that are growing. These companies are essentially a lot larger um, and they're looking at taking longer periods. And as a result, because they're investing for anything between five and 10 years, uh, they're going to do a lot of rigorous due diligence and will most likely want a board seat on that. They are also looking at exits and the exit is mainly to uh, another a trade investor or a strategic investor or possibly even the IPO. I just want to go back because I realized I skipped a family office. A family office is really ultra net high net worth investors. Uh, these are families that tend to have have made their money from usually from generations, second, third generation, now have a formal structure on which they deploy capital, have a, a, a have a predisposition towards um, entrepreneurs that are operating in the industries that they know and they understand tend to be elusive, need to be uh, obtained through introductions and referrals, but can be uh, really approached during entrepreneurship conferences. And last but not least, we have strategic investors. Strategic investors are really corporate arms uh, that are looking to, at other entrepreneurial business as how they can actually use uh, a business to grow their, their customer base to improve their uh, efficiency, get more human capital and enter a market that they possibly weren't. And a famous example of this is really looking at Facebook's investment in both WhatsApp and Instagram. So um, in terms of that, uh, what are some of the considerations when we look at all the other aspects with um, with investors. Um, some of the investors are sector based, so they are focused on dominant sectors in Africa like agriculture, innovative areas like technology and emerging areas such as uh, creatives industries. They are region based, so looking out for the ones that have a focus on the African continent, looking at deal size, very specific on which area ticket size are these investors looking at. And the ticket size really determines if you're eligible 
eligible to be considered by that investor. There is there are also impact investors looking at how well you are doing against something like the sustainable development goals and what com- are you serving underserved are you looking at underserved communities or are you creating jobs? All of these things um, um, are looking for uh, are are very important for impact investors. We have institutional investors. These are like pension funds. Even we have a retirement benefits authority act, which allows 10% really to go into private equity, mainly through funds. And we also have special interest groups with gender and youth. And as you heard from me, I have a soft spot uh, uh, for women, but we have youth also groups 18 to um, 35. So the next slide is just giving you an overview, showing where you are in your revenue cycle, where you are in years of operation, and giving you a sense of which particular investor type is most suited for you during that journey. Um, and then this other slide is really a broad look at uh, at the venture capital view over 2014 to 2019, really looking at the different deals that have been done in this continent during this period, sitting at about $3.9 billion. I think one of the key things to note is that most of the investors, 40% of them are U.S. related. We also have the median deal size uh, coming at about uh, a, a 2.1 million dollars. We also have preference sectors that are being show, uh, shown there really uh, ranging from fintech to logistics, uh, to utilities, uh, to healthcare. So really seeing where you fall alongside um, that particular uh, spectrum of where deals have been done. So I'll go next to what do you need to consider when you are engaging with investors? Well, the main thing first is the alignment to the investment thesis. Have you been able to look at what the investor does and see, are you aligned from a deal size perspective, a region perspective, a sector perspective, a, a turnover perspective? All of these things matter whether you're going to get through the door. So it's not just about an investor opening offices in this country. It's about whether your business business speaks to the investment strategy. Then there's the other aspect about the unique solution that you have to offer. And is this solution, is it disruptive? Is it compelling? What is the size of the market? What is the ability to capture it? What is the comp- who are the competitors that are there? And, w- and what is the opportunity to scale within this particular market? So those are things that investors consider very important. The other thing is the uses of funds. Uh, investors are looking at, uh, are you using these funds for growth activities? So are you using these funds to purchase equipment, to do product development, for market expansion, as opposed to just simply uh, refinancing or meeting working capital needs. And um, all of these things determine whether an investor would consider you. You're also looking at the competitive returns and you're looking at are you offering something that beats the opportunity cost of putting that money in a fixed deposit or a bond for the risk the investor is going to take? What are those returns and what is that particular period and what is the likelihood of actually achieving those returns? And that is why the exit is so important. And then the team and track record is really very critical because not only is it about the solution, but it's about the credibility and the people that are delivering the solution. Uh, does the team, is it a sole founder? Do they have a co, do they have a co-founder? How strong is the management team? How cohesive is the team? What is the track record and the milestones that the team has been able to achieve together? And all of these things really create and improve the confidence of an investor dealing with you. And the other is the deployment cycle. Where is the investor in the deployment cycle? Do you know if they're still raising capital and they're looking for deals? Do you know if you're going to be their first investment or their last investment? All those things play into their mind. So understanding and getting to know where the investor is in their deployment capital. So what are some of the key things that I would like you to understand about uh, before you approach uh, investors? Get to know your investor. Make an effort in learning more about them. Don't approach, uh, approach an investor blindly. Do your homework. Look at yourself and ask, what are your deal breakers? What are you willing to accept? Are you willing to cede control? Are you willing to accept strategic and operational advice? 
what about valuation? Have you been able to take your business to a, a, an independent party to really look and see how your business is valued, uh, which is away from what you may perceive it to be? What's your attitude? Aside from being confident, are you willing to learn? Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to adapt? Are you open to feedback? And in terms of reporting, those are all things that are really important during due diligence. What level of documentation backs up the processes within your company and backs out the systems and how you eventually do things? So just like everyone else, the investment community has also been impacted by COVID. And as a result of this, there are a number of things that are affecting uh, the industry. One of it has really got to do with um, most of the investors are partners. So they're focused on the existing business. How are my existing businesses doing? Addition, uh, in addition to that, uh, because of the uncertain environment, valuations are now unclear. Companies that were doing well before COVID are not necessarily the ones that are going to come out on the other side. Companies that may have been struggling pre-COVID are now doing different things. So valuations are unclear. In terms of deal sourcing and due diligence, which was something of very physical and site visits, and it, it goes beyond just checking the documentation. That has to be done more virtually, which changes ways. Fundraising prospects have changed. Whether you're dealing with an angel, a family office, a grant, governments have had to reprioritize. Businesses have had to conserve how they do. All of these things affect the flow of capital. But there is an opportunity with a potential pipeline, and investors are really looking for the new normal. How is the business going to pivot? How is the business actually going to innovate? And how is the business going to survive and show the resilience of management? Uh, investors are looking for realistic valuations that take this into account and really looking for online visibility beyond your web, uh, your website. What is, what's happening on social media? What level of engagement is happening with you? So as we go there, I'll just leave you with a few tips as uh, you go, just to as you interact with different investors. One of the key things is broaden networks, meet investors informally. Even if you meet an investor that is not aligned with your investment thesis, please establish a rapport with them because they might just introduce you and refer you to other investors that could help you. Always have a decent pitch deck and elevator pitch ready. And there are templates and, uh, uh, and uh, consultants that can support you with that. Please enter competitions for visibility, not simply in it to win it, but also for the process, for the peer networking, for the experience, for the feedback. Get to learn what it is to be part of a competitive process and see how you do. Invest in your own knowledge about what investors do. And remember, there is no true way or one way to fundraise. You can use a combination of angels to family offices to grants, all of these business accelerators to get where you want to go. So I wish you all the luck. Thank you.